Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that, well, money can buy happiness at least up to a point. Research that I've talked about in the past showed that people are happiest when they make about $75,000 a year. But Purdue University shows that people still say their emotional well being is highest when they make, on average, in a household between sixty and $75,000 a year. And that accounts for the comfort of daily purchasing power. But here's what's interesting. People believe that more money, about 95000 a year, is ideal for what they call life evaluation, like long-term goals and comparing yourself to peers. So researchers observed declines in emotional well-being and life satisfaction above the $95,000 mark. You can be saying, what the heck? Well, they found this out by conducting a large analysis of data from the Gallup World Poll, which looked at 1.7 million people from 164 countries. And what they talk about is things like, you know, big raise can make you happy for just a satisfied level, but generally people making 200,000 a year didn't report significantly more happiness than those making 95. And there's something called the hedonic treadmill that you've probably heard about suggests that you adjust really quickly to having a certain amount of money. So before you would have tipped five bucks, now you tip 20 bucks, but your level of satisfaction is about the same. And as I went through my career, my first job uh, out of college, a uh, first quote, real job, I think was about 40,000 a year. Uh, and it took me all of four years to cross, uh, or maybe three years to cross 100 back in the dot-com boom. And I can tell you, crossing that 75,000 mark, yeah, it, it was really, it was really pretty beneficial. Uh, however, you just, uh, I, I, when I look back on this, uh, as, as additional money came in, we were like, you know, unless I want to buy a different car, this isn't going to change my daily behavior. It is true. Uh, and that's not saying more money isn't helpful and beneficial. It's just that happiness didn't go up. I've never seen the study that said it actually went down above 95,000. The study was also kind of cool because it talks about, Latin America, where the ideal income is 35,000. And in Australia and New Zealand, it's 125,000. And they found, as you'd expect, in Southeast Asia, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and parts of Africa were way lower than global numbers, just based on low, uh, local economics and availability of things. So it's just interesting to say, if you have that voice in your head the way I did in the first half of my career, that I'll be happy when, and you put a dollar sign on there, you're totally wrong. And if you don't believe me, read Game Changers because I talked with a bunch of people about this. It's one of those things that the people who do really big things in the world have figured out, that being happy will make you successful and possibly wealthy, but focusing on wealth will probably not make you successful or happy. I wish someone had told me that when I was a teenager. Man, I would have traveled more. All right, next up, as you probably expect, we're going to be talking a little bit about money and happiness because, well, I am the master of foreshadowing at this point. And today's guest is a friend and a guy who's talking from a few times on the way because he's in Tokyo. He's a best-selling author of self-development books in Japan. Now, I'm assuming that you're hard to fool here. So you know how many people who've written a book aren't best-selling authors? Not very many because you can become a best-selling author in you know, left-handed uh, fiction about something or another on some bizarre category on Amazon, something your best-selling book, and you've sold two books. So it doesn't mean anything, but check this. He sold 7 million copies of the 115 books he's written since 2001, and about one in 20 Japanese people has read one of his books. So this guy's a big deal in Japan, literally. Ken, hopefully you're laughing at that. I don't know if you know about, know about that, Joe. <laughs> Yes. about being a big deal in Japan, but there's some <laughs> old American movie, I forget, where they, they say, I'm a big deal in Japan. Yeah. Uh, but he talks about life, work, life balance, wealth, and happiness. And I, I found that there's really great knowledge there. I got to know Ken Honda through membership in Jack Canfield's Transformational Leadership Council, a group of personal development people. We're going to talk today about his newest book, uh, his debut in the US. And it's worth your time to listen to this episode because the book is called Happy Money, The Japanese Art of Making Peace with Your Money. 
And it's coming out literally the day this podcast airs, uh, in part because I'm hoping you'll go out and buy it because Ken's a friend and because his book is worth your time. Uh, you could call this the financial version of the secret art of tidying things up, which, uh, well, th this is more effective in my mind than um, hiding your coffee making equipment under the counter, which was what happened when uh, my wife read uh, Marie Kondo's book and hid my coffee equipment, which did not simplify my life and actually made me a little bit upset. So a few breathing exercises, two weeks of forgiveness work and uh, building my own coffee altar at home that was thou shalt not cross. Everything was all good, but it wasn't tidy. Anyway, back to Ken. When you do this with your money, it totally works. And it's about energy, it's about happiness. Now, Ken? Hello, Dave. Okay, you've written 115 books. That's insane. Yes. Um, <laughs> why? Why do you keep writing so many books? I have written 50 something, published about uh, twice as many, but still. Oh, you published? Okay, so you only wrote <laughs> half of those. Okay, I, I didn't know that about you. I just thought you were incredibly prolific. So you've written about 50 something, but you published other people's books as well. That makes more yeah. sense. Yes, but still, like I, I, I publish um, once, uh, one book every two months or three. So um, everywhere I go, the galley is following me. Okay, so that, that's how you got that many books out. That makes sense over the course of 10, 15 years. Now now I think you're 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 still superhuman, but but just you know more within the realm of the universe I live in. But what's different about your experience being Japanese? I mean, you lived in Boston for a while, mm -hmm. but what, what do Japanese people do differently? What's the culture, uh, cultural take on money that America is maybe missing? What's interesting is that I I go all over the world and talk with people about money, and uh, certain culture have certain tendency. For example, Japanese people love saving, whereas probably American people love spending. So if we can meet in the middle, uh, we have a, a better and healthier um, life in terms of money. But Japanese people are obsessive uh, saver uh, in my category type, and they love to save for uh, future. But that doesn't mean that you can enjoy your life. So uh, I recommend all the Japanese people start spending money for fun. But whereas in other countries like Latin culture, they spend uh, so much money right at the moment, which is a happy way of living. But if you have no money in the bank, you may end up in trouble sometimes. So um, um, living in mod uh, moderation always helps with happiness. Well. I'm a huge fan of of Japanese culture. Um, I've been to Japan quite a few times, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a an attention to to detail that, that's mm -hmm. kind of built into the way people think that I that I really appreciate. Yeah, and I'm also just a level of respect that's built into even just the way someone hands you a business card. There's there's something just cool about that, and it's, it's one thing if it's done out of you know, fear or obligation, another thing where it, it I don't know it just feels classy to me. Mm -hmm. Now. That said, uh, a penny pinching lifestyle, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is what 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 you're describing, would feel like to a typical American. Mm -hmm. You're saying, "Look, I want to spend on my experience. I want to feel good. I could lose my money." We've learned in the U.S., you know, there's going to be a recession. Probably someone will inflate the money right out of my account, or you know, someone will come along and take it one way or the other. You just like money is ephemeral, and you don't have much control. So you might as well get your degree or you know, don't buy a car, but go see Peru uh, because no one can take Peru once you've seen it. <laughs> right. Yes. But what do you say to someone like that? That's actually kind of a truthful statement. Yes. So, uh, you know, when you deal with money, um, you have to find happiness on your own version. So some people are okay without any saving and other people feel more secure with some saving. But what I'm teaching people is you transform your relationship with money in a happier way, which is to appreciate money um, when it comes in, when it goes out. And if you uh, pre keep appreciating the money in your life, you have a better relationship with your money. But people are sometimes afraid, people abuse money, and uh, people try not to get close to money, so they, they avoid money. So there are many types of people, but uh, uh, we cannot find happiness in doing so. So it's about shifting your energy towards your money from fear, mm -hmm. you know, fear of losing the money. Yes. Uh, which I think is, it's endemic in, in the US. Uh -huh. um, that, that I feel like I don't have control. I 
could probably lose it even if I put it in the stock market because I'm a good investor. Oh, mm -hmm. well, I'm sorry, that didn't work. Or I put it in Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry, that didn't work, right? That's right. Uh, so, but you're shifting from that fear mindset uh -huh. into gratitude. And gratitude's a through line in like half the interviews I've done out of 600 on, on the show mm -hmm. where it keeps coming up. All right, what in, in your book, uh, what's the method or technique of uh, being grateful for your money? I mean, yeah. do, you, um, do you like hold up a bill and, and meditate or yeah. <laughs> it's I, very superficial? Yes, yes. I actually learned about this from my mentor, Wahei Takeda, who's called Warren Buffett of Japan. He's a um, uh, major investor of uh, more than 100 public companies in Japan. And I had a chance to talk about money with him and ask him, what is the secret of wealth? And he said, there's only one thing, appreciate the money, arigato the money. And I asked him, that's it? And he said, there are actually two, appreciate the money when it comes in and appreciate the money when it goes out. So either way, you appreciate money. By doing that, you start this cycle of appreciation. And people uh, tend to attract more money uh, when they appreciate money. And if you are afraid of money, you kind of turn them away. So it's, it's a very simple Zen uh, way of teaching. And I've, been, I've taught about uh, this principle for uh, uh, more than 100,000 people. And I've hearing in, uh, been hearing incredible res results by just saying arigato the money. So I just want everybody to try that. That's my message. That, that's really cool uh, because I, I'm thinking about this. Uh -huh. In fact, uh, a long time ago, a, a friend, uh, Manish Sethi, uh, came on the show. And Manish is a, a competitive guy and he makes this device called Pavlock that shocks your wrist when you when you do something that's a bad habit so that your body will learn <laughs> to do good habits that's by good. fearing bad habits. I mean, uh, it's, it's a little dark, right? Mm. But it's also funny. And it lets your friends shock you over Facebook, which is even funnier. <laughs> uh, but one of his motivators was he would make a bet uh, kind of against himself because he he just hated losing money so much. For him, it was a big motivator because every time the money got out of his hand, it was a loss. It was pain. Mm. And what you're saying here is that even in the Japanese culture where saving is is something that's encouraged and and really uh, elevated is something that that's kind of a moral obligation. Like mm -hmm. you take care of your family and your future by saving. Uh, that even in that scenario when you go to spend is this a, a Japanese habit today that most people have or one that you're working to encourage not, to say I'm grateful that I get to spend on whatever I'm spending on. Not yet, but uh, because of what he's teaching and I, my books, a lot more people are doing it. And it's, it's, it works and it's fun. Because when we uh, pay money, uh, that means we're getting something in return, either a service or goods. So that means we, uh, somebody is doing good for us. So we can appreciate that person for doing something great to us. So by just doing that, uh, you keep get, getting a more thank you back to you. So what's interesting is there's an example uh, I talk about appreciation about money. So uh, one uh, woman, a young woman, found out that she didn't appreciate enough to her boss because he, he is the one who is giving her the salary. And so she brought a box of chocolate to um, her boss saying, thank you so much for keeping uh, me as an employee. And a few weeks later, she got a raise. Just by expressing that, that gratitude. Yeah. So whenever you uh, uh, express gratitude, people love like you. So they will. Well, that also could just be a bribe, right? When you bribe people, <laughs> they like you too. Yeah. Uh, you know, probably like a happy bribe because people, <laughs> people, you know, unless you're a government employee or something, you know, people love people who appreciate you or give you something. And this uh, appreciation is a fun uh, and fun merry go around of money. So once you're in a cycle of happy, merry go around of money, you just find more joy in receiving and giving. And uh, when you look at it, we're living in a financial life of receiving and giving. When we do uh, so with grace, uh, when both coming in and coming out uh, with appreciation, um, we have uh, less fear. So uh, what he's teaching is very profound because he said, uh, if you worry about money, just thank the money because appreciating about money and worrying about the money, you cannot do it at the same time. And it works. Wow. This is 
something that is a tried and true technique because you cannot feel gratitude and any sort of sympathetic activation at the same time. Like it's a, it's a physical impossibility. So that's the switch. Mm -hmm. I've only met Oprah once. So she, I know she didn't tell me that time. So it must've been uh, a, a video interview I saw with her. And she talked about how I never get tired of hiding money for people. <laughs> she'll, she'll go around like leave a twenty dollar bill here, yeah. and you know, inside a book or whatever. Then you know people are are happy. Mm -hmm. And your mentor, who's known as you know the the Warren Buffett of Japan, mm -hmm. okay, I'm pretty sure that he and Oprah uh, probably can you know ride on each other's jets all day long, and it's <laughs> not going to change their life in any way, shape, or form. Yeah. But if you're making $75,000 a year, that magic number I talked about at the beginning of the show, and you leave someone a $100 tip because they just did something so above and beyond, like, well, I just took my income from kind of 75 to you know, 74,900, <laughs> right? So now I'm below the happiness threshold. point. Like, like when, <laughs> when you're working on having enough, right? I mean, it shouldn't you be a little bit more attentive uh -huh. and hold on to your money real tightly and maybe yeah. don't spend so much gratitude? Yeah. So. The interesting thing is you don't have to make a lot of money uh, when you try to go into this cycle of happy money. Even if you're making little little, uh, little money, you can still appreciate the money. So it's just a, um, your mental attitude about money. Even if you're making a million dollars and if you're not appreciative of how much you have and how much you receive and how much you spend, you're still uh, complaining about money. So who would be happier? making a million dollars and complaining or the people who are making about $25,000 but very appreciative of what's happening in their life. So appreciation is the key. And probably uh, it's um, more uh, stable if you have a higher income, but you don't have to have that. And so my teaching works for uh, any income bracket people. And that's what I'm so enjoying it. You don't have to be super wealthy to be happy. Because happiness happens in the moment. So once you appreciate your money, you start appreciating about your family, what you have, and everything in life. So it's very zen. Once you're in this state of gratitude, your life shifts. And that uh, opens the door to a new possibility of attracting more uh, fun things in your life. And it's nothing to do with how much money you have or how much money you make. I'm thinking of a, a YouTube video I, I saw a few years ago. These two young punk uh kind of skeptical not energetically very nice guys like well we're gonna give you know 100 bucks to this homeless guy uh -huh. and we're gonna secretly follow him and we're gonna see what he does and when he's gonna go buy drugs and alcohol and you know something bad and so they they follow the guy and what he does he goes and he buys food for all of his friends wow. and he's like super happy to do it and, and literally yeah. gives the money away even though he's homeless and has no money and in the, these two, you know, these are, you know, probably like 18, 19 year old guys making a, a, you know, their YouTube thing. And you could see they were just like, I don't know, I, I don't do with this. And they went up to the guy and they're like, we're so sorry. We didn't understand. And they gave him all the money in their wallet. Yes. Just, hey, <laughs> like you're, you're a greater human than we are. Uh, and it seems like that's an extreme case where someone who really doesn't have very much mm -hmm. is able to have that mindset and say, you know what, what is this going to do? Uh, so, all right. And, and your take on this happy money is that in addition to happiness, it actually drives abundance in your life and that yes. it somehow magnetically attracts more money into your life. Uh huh. And also with, even without attracting anything, if you can appreciate more about your life, you know, you'll be a lot, um, happier. So I think it works. Now, Every night uh, before bed, I, I I sit down with both my kids. Actually, I'm talking to them and I say, hey, tell me three things you're grateful for today. Mm -hmm. Now, they've never once said, I'm grateful for my money. Uh, and they've, they've never uh, you know, talked about that. They get their little allowance and I show them about interest rates and all the stuff that you do to teach kids to be financially literate. And they don't really think like that. And if they did, I, I kind of feel like I'd be like, wow, my kids are focusing on greed. And you know, they, they could have been grateful for all the good stuff that happened and said that guy, I, I my, my savings accounts bigger. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that? So, you know, once you're kind of hooked into this um, marketing system that we're in, the more is better. You're supposed to have stuff. And once you get stuck in this cycle, you'll be sucked into the system. I have a friend who is uh, pretty wealthy and he, he bought, just bought a helicopter for uh, 
for his, for his fun. And but he's still complaining because he doesn't have a debt. So like how much money and how much stuff you're... It's a serious problem, Ken. <laughs> and you have the same problem, right? I mean, my helicopter is just not fast enough. It's a, it's yeah, a I know. <laughs> seat, seat, isn't soft, you know, seat isn't soft enough. So there's so many things we could easily complain. So it's either you're, you're complaining about the situation or you're grateful for the situation you're in. So uh, cultivating an attitude of appreciation is, is really the key to happiness. So what I'm teaching is like, you don't have to be super wealthy or super smart or successful. Um, all you have to do is appreciate where you are. It's more Zen and I'm teaching with money. And then if you can uh, do that with money, you can do it with uh, many other things. But uh, money fear is one of the biggest in life. So that's why I'm just teaching people to at least find peace with money. And after that, you have an amazing life because once you're free of um, fear of money, you can do so many things and you realize that how uh, restricted we were because of money. And it's nothing to do with money. It's about our fear um, toward the future or toward our life. And once we are more free to it, you know, we don't get stuck in this cultural thing it is a survival thing. There's a voice in most people's head that says, if I don't have as much money as I have now, or if I don't have enough, even yes. though that's not a real number, uh -huh. um, I'll die. I'll starve to death. And when you think about the reality of that, well, in many countries, uh, there's a social system. I live in Canada where if you don't have anything, don't worry, your medical's covered and uh, there's, there's enough care. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be pleasant, but you're very unlikely to starve. Mm-hmm. Um, you'll, your health may go down and all, but you're, you're, you're not going to die and you'll, you'll be able to function. Mm -hmm. And it's that way in a lot of countries and other countries. I, I mean, I've been to Cambodia where a dollar a day was considered, in fact, it was the average income, but I mean, there were some really happy people there. In fact, I was, I was really humbled by going, oh my God, these people have nothing and their country has been torn by war and they're on average happier than most of my friends at the time. <laughs> yes. Uh, maybe that was the problem with my friends. Yeah. I'm just kidding guys. I'm probably still <laughs> friends with some of those people, but so, so the, the mindset is real. We do something at uh, the personal development side on the 40 Years of Zen, uh, where when people are really stuck on something, mm -hmm. it, it's quite often not a fear of money. Sometimes it's that fear of starving to death or mm -hmm. you know, not having love or you know, making a mistake that results in you know, your family being harmed. And all these deep, dark things that no one wants to talk about, but they're circling around. And when you meditate and you think about it, like, oh my God, I didn't realize I was worrying so much. Mm -hmm. And I have them do something called a a worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. And I want to get your take on this. And yeah. the worst case scenario is you, you sit down and like, hey, I want you to imagine the worst possible world yeah. where like, you know, you've screwed up everything you could have done and you know what actually happens there. And, and they kind of feel the pain and they live through it. And yeah. of course we're doing some neurofeedback on them. But yeah. At the end of the time, like, oh my God, it really wasn't as bad as I thought it was. Uh, now I've experienced it. I've lost my fear. Yeah. Do you recommend people do that with money too? Yeah, it's, and it's very simple because uh, all the money fear boils down to uh, like, if I have no money, I'm going to die. But yeah. that doesn't happen. I've met so many people um, who, uh, who at uh, one time in their life had no money, but they didn't die. But they, they could have killed themselves. That's, that could be the, the only cause um, that no money could uh, cause you. But, you know... Uh, so no money is a situation we all of us are worried. That's why we are compulsive to uh, save money or compulsive to make more, uh, to do more in business. But I recommend uh, to find security in your heart, not in a bank account. And uh, the, the fun thing I talk about is uh, having more friends is more secure than having money in the bank. So I, I teach people to make uh, more than 50 friends who can let you stay for a week. I wrote it in the book, but uh, so um, if you have no money, visit your number one friend and say, can I stay with you for a week? And the second week, third week, after about 50 weeks, you can come back to your friend number one. So the whole year you can go live without any money. Once you have a list of people, I, I did it at one time and I, and I saw more than 200 names so I can live without any money for four years or five years. So. Once you know you'll be protected if you're in a no money situation, you can do anything. And uh, so don't depend on social security or uh, government. If you have uh, friends and relatives and a family that you can depend on, 
you know, you don't you don't have to worry about money anymore because somebody else will just will not let you fall. And this is the uh, more secure feeling than having so much money in the bank because you'll be afraid that somebody will rob it or sue you. So I recommend to find security in your heart and friends. Does Mr. Rogers, uh, the TV show, is that something that ever got no. brought to Japan? Or No. no. I, I, I'm then, this is a very famous kids TV show uh -huh. in the US. Uh, Mr. Rogers has passed away, but he used to talk about what his mother would tell him when there was a great disaster, like a fire or an earthquake mm -hmm. or you know a, a flood, something really big. And people are freaking out and they're panicking and the news is covering it and it's a big disaster. And his mom would, would tell him, look for the helpers. Mm. The, the Mr. Rogers example there is, is this relaxing feeling that happens where instead of looking at the, the fear and the disaster, mm -hmm. you realize that there's always someone there to help. And then you realize, oh, the human condition is actually that it feels good to help other people. And yes. that when you think you're you're going to die and if you really need help, the odds are that someone's going to be there and someone's going to help you. And if they don't, you'll die. And then, well, oops. <laughs> but <laughs> you, you can either focus on it and then you'll die or you can focus on, you know, someone's got my back. Yeah. And even if that's not always true, provably, building it into your nervous system seems to make quality of life a lot better. You, you agree with that? Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, Japan is, uh, we have so many earthquakes, fires, and, and these days, U.S. is also having fire and flood. And after that, you know, look how many people are helping one another. And it's so beautiful. And I'm always impressed with how people help each other after a big disaster. You know, when a uh, big uh, earthquake hit, Japan uh, nine years ago or eight years ago, I was so impressed with so many stuff coming from all over the world and especially from US. So I want to uh, appreciate American and also Canadian people. Canadian and Americans, uh, they're the, one of the first people to arrive in Japan and they sent so many uh, people to, to help. So I believe in um, that somebody will help you once you're in trouble. And if you have that feeling, you are so uh, free of fear. That's how I believe. The, the flip side of that, though, is you could just be naive. Yes. Okay? When I went to Tibet, one of the people in the party I was traveling with was like, like oh, everything will be just fine. And, and finally, I looked at her. I'm like, look, <laughs> we are going into a place where it's going to be 10 degrees below zero at 18,000 <laughs> feet elevation. People die yeah. on this mountain. Wow. It's called Mount Kailash. People go there specifically to die. Uh -huh. and like, like your your life is at risk if you don't have a warm jacket. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, the universe is going to provide. I mean, no, no, <laughs> we're going to stop here and you're going to buy a warm jacket. You know, right. it's ugly because and, and the truth of the matter is that really it would have been a, probably a hypothermia death situation without mm -hmm. an insulated jacket in those conditions. Um, so how do you know if you're being Pollyanna yeah. and you're, oh, the universe has my back <laughs> versus uh, just pragmatic and, and confident? Yeah, so I think there's this line uh, between trusting and being just simply stupid. <laughs> you know, so uh, I'm not saying like, uh, go fly from a cliff, the wings will just grow up from your back. That doesn't happen. Right, someone will catch you. Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, uh, we're so um, afraid to start something because uh, of the fear of money. So I'm just suggesting mm -hmm. uh, worrying about money does more fear, uh, more harm than just, you know, trusting uh, the yeah. money flow. So once you have the uh, trust, um, oftentimes it works much better. And uh, so I just recommend people taking more risk in their life, at least a little more. One of the things that I consciously chose to do, uh, this was a, a recommendation from Michael Fishman, who's on many, many episodes ago, the guy who started Rodale Health, so men's health and women's health and all those. Mm -hmm. You probably know Michael. Mm -hmm. He said, Dave, uh, when I'm leaving tips, sometimes I open my wallet and I don't have any any small bills. And he said, so I just made it a personal policy that I am going to give them a big bill then because it's my fault if I didn't have a small bill for tipping, mm -hmm. not their fault. Uh, and he said, at, at this point in my life, I, it's probably not going to harm me greatly if I do that. So I said, all right, I'm going to do the same thing. And there's been a few times where I've given a $100 tip wow. to You're generous. carry my bags. Well, it's because I, I said, all right, I'm going to take, I'm going to follow this rule. Uh -huh. And if I didn't have time to get fives or tens or twenties or whatever, 
and you know, I, I could say, sorry, man, hit you up next time. And he's like, yeah, right, whatever. Um, you probably won't. Or I can just say, look, I, I have this thing. If I don't have small bills, I just use one of the ones I've got. So today's your lucky day. And man, you, two things happen. One, you always see this amazing look of just gratitude. You know, the, the person's really happy as you'd expect. It's, it's unexpected. But I also found it happens with an uncanny amount of the time when someone actually was really cool mm -hmm. and they already they already performed above the level of what would have been expected. Yeah. Uh, so when they showed extra care, they remembered everything. Like they they just delivered a level of service that was amazing. And all of a sudden, like, wow, I, I'm actually really happy that I am tipping for this massage at a hundred bucks instead of the twenty dollars that would be customary. Uh, but it was a damn good massage. Yeah. <laughs> so, um. I just figure the universe balances all that out. But then again, I'm also not, you know, hand to mouth and I'm able to make my mortgage payments. Mm -hmm. If I wasn't making my mortgage payments, I just wouldn't do that. Mm -hmm. But I would still go out of my way to make sure that I tip whatever the, the minimum appropriate amount is just because it's, at least in the US, that's part of how you do it. Yes. And it, it's great for you. You know, some people think you can do it because you're wealthy, but wealthy people started uh, being generous uh, long before they, they started making money. So this is totally true. Yeah. I, so I think uh, generosity wins at the end. Uh, it, it does. And it's something that isn't taught, at least something I've never seen taught in, in American schools. Mm -hmm. And I was definitely uh, exceptionally cheap when I was in college because <laughs> I had nothing. Uh -huh. um, but I was also probably pretty much of a jerk. And, you know, like if I can get away with saving a dollar and, and you just realize that even if at the time I made four bucks an hour um, or the, the time when I, I welded truck frames for a living for a while. I, I still, it just felt like you go to a restaurant and you, you you don't tip the waitress at least what the very minimum is. It, you, you kind of feel like you're stealing and maybe that's my parents or something. Yeah, I think uh, that's what, that's why you're so successful and supported. You know, um, I, I really um, am grateful for your generosity. Uh, talking about your uh, generosity, you are the one, remember, who initiated it, the whole process of my publishing in U.S., you introduced oh, yeah. me, your uh, agent, uh, very generously, and the whole thing started. You know, and then I'm publishing in more than 30 countries in the world. Uh, the, your new book. Well, uh, you've you've done the work, and and one thing that I find uh, makes me uh, really happy is, is being able to help people who who have uh, put in the time and, and the merit. So when we met in Japan. Uh, and you had mentioned that you know, you'd started uh, on Bulletproof Coffee, and it was, it was when I was there for a book signing. Yeah. A lot of people in the U.S. They don't know. I sold 180,000 copies of the Bulletproof Diet in Japan with no market. Like it totally caught on like, like crazy. Right. Yeah. And, and so I just had a chance to meet you and I'm like, wait, I think the U.S. could use this stuff. So it was just one phone call. But you, you got to understand something here, Ken. Yes. I, I did that for you. But you know who did that for me? Uh-huh. Um, two people in, in particular stand out. Uh, one of them is uh, Rick Rubin, mm -hmm. <laughs> who... Uh, you know, famous music producer who's been on the show. And when I said, I think I'm going to self-publish my book, he's like, no, nah, let, let me just make a phone call. And, and he was so cool. And it was just one phone call, but it really changed the direction. And then JJ Virgin, who's also been on the show, is, is a dear friend. And she said, Dave, you're not, you're not doing this book thing right. It just sat me down. And, and it was the two of them who convinced me to go with my agent, who I got to introduce you to. But it's one of those, you pay it forward things. So people yeah. paid it forward for me. I'm just passing the baton. So I know you'll find someone else and you'll do the same. Yes, but exactly. That's actually how the world works. Right. And it works that way with money. It works that way with, with helping. But if someone came to me, and was like, you have to do this. <laughs> and you know, I, I, yeah. I copied this book from someone else's website and I want to be just, you know, I'm going to, I don't know, there's, there's a bunch of people out there who don't have integrity and then you just kind of pass on. How do you know with a money perspective? How do you know if you're dealing with someone who just wants your money yeah. versus someone who, is genuinely is in, in need of, of your help. Yeah, so would help I you. think people uh, like and support uh, other people who will ask you politely. I think it's uh, true any culture. So when, if, when people are pushed, they don't like to <clears throat> do that for you, especially in a partnership. You know, one time I was asked by my uh, wife, like, have you taken out the garbage? I was going to, but once once she told me what to do, you know, I lost this motivation to do that. So if you, if somebody's pushing you, you don't want to feel like it. But if somebody asks you politely, you feel the joy of helping. So pushing always doesn't work in any culture, in my opinion. And and then if you just do uh, keep doing, uh, I, I, we've been talking about generosity. 
being generous um, with whatever you do, people will automatically help you. And, and I think this is the universe. Uh, this is uh, so fun. Uh, without your knowledge, Bulletproof Coffee is so popular in Japan, especially among uh, entrepreneurs and uh, um, very intelligent people. And now young people are doing it. So you'll be so amazed. You know, I'm, I want to uh, do an event with you sometime because I do that all the time. You'll be amazed how much people appreciate you once you get here and just talk with people. So that generosity, yeah, is, is happening in such a weird way uh, without your knowledge. It, 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 the weird way is really weird. <laughs> uh, I, I've done, I've done uh, business conferences in Japan uh -huh. uh, in my tech career, and you know, culture is formal. You wear a suit. And so I, I went there for a book signing because I felt an obligation just to say thanks. And plus, it was a chance to go to Japan. I like Japan. So I, I went there and I went to a, a big bookstore. And in fact, there's one where, where we met. And a couple of people come up to me to sign their books and they lift up their shirts like, <laughs> like a man and a woman. Yeah. And, and I'm like, hold on. I'm in Japan. <laughs> Normally, people will kind of they'll they'll bow and hand you a pen. But it, 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 what is going on? And it, I I just my eyes almost crossed. Like I don't know what what is happening here. And what was happening is they're saying we grew abs. Like look at our abs. <laughs> right. But they weren't the only ones. It, it would happen probably twenty times. Uh -huh. And I was just like, wow, a completely unexpected experience. But it was it was a gratitude and results and just a happiness thing. So I. <laughs> yeah, that still sticks really heavily in my mind because it, it was so cool. Right, and I think somehow gen generous people often attract good people. So that's what's, what's happening in Japan, at least. So we'll just mm. I'm planning to do something in the future for you. Oh, th thank It'll you. It'll be Ken. fun. I, I I appreciate it. Yeah, and we can talk about this too. Early in life, I, I used to think that things were, were sort of transactional. Like, oh, I'm going to do that person a favor. They're going to owe me a favor. Mm -hmm. And you have like these little bank accounts of favors right. to people. <laughs> and generosity doesn't really work like that. Uh -huh. What's the difference between that, that transactional generosity and just general generosity? I think if you're just open to a, a, a generosity, you know, generosity will, will support you. You know, our mutual friend and, and my mentor, and, and he, he's probably yours, Dr. John Gray, he is oh, so John, generous. Yeah. He tips people 30, 40%. He allowed me to say that in public. You know, he is the most generous person I've ever seen, uh, I've ever met. So uh, when I observe generous people, they tend to be generous with everybody, right? So somehow mm -hmm. uh, people are attracted to that uh, person without even knowing uh, who he is. And, and then uh, gradually, uh, without knowing, he or she pulls out the best in people. That's why generous generous people tend to attract uh, more generosity. There's a, a skeptical engineering side of me that says, what is the mechanism mm -hmm. by which that happens? Mm -hmm. and I have some thoughts about that, but do you know the mechanism? <laughs> is, is this a mystical power? Are there you know, generosity fairies floating around? <laughs> How does this work? I think uh, what Wahe's teaching is actually, if you're connected to this uh, generosity universe, everything happens generously. So one time, uh, Wahe uh, uh, did some uh, real estate uh, deal, and then he realized, or uh, uh, his friend, a student, realized that somebody was cheating on him. And so he was he could have saved uh, like a million dollars in, in this deal, but so he was overpriced. And so he, his student was very upset and telling him, you were cheated by this guy. And Wahe asked the, uh, the person, uh, why is this happening? So the person who sold the land needed the cash because he was supposed to give back the money to uh, the, their, his friend. And so Wahe said, so the person who sold the land to me is happy because he got the money. And the person who lent him the money who sold me the land is also happy. So everybody's happy, so I'm happy. And he wanted the land anyway, even though he paid more than he needed to. <laughs> yeah. He still got the land, which made him yeah. happy. Right. So, like, what is there to worry about it? Because I'm happy too. And that kind of attitude, you know, he's losing one million dollars, but somehow mysteriously, he gets um, so much money back in a more mysterious way. And I can't really explain that scientifically, but 
why he seems to attract uh, so many good things in the in his life. And uh, if you uh, if I I want I want a scientist um, checks his life because uh, probability theory doesn't work with him because incredible mm-hmm. thing happened. Like uh, he didn't make enough money for the factory, so he had to shut down the factory. But because of the highway was going near his uh, factory, he lost all the business, but he made 20 times more than he invested in the factory because of the highway crossing near his factory. So what what is it, you know? (laughs) So I I think it's just the generosity universe uh, is helping you. So I don't want to uh, sound too spiritual, but if you study closely about how Google did, Apple and Amazon did, there are so many interesting stories that, you know, none of the business school can uh, uh, really explain. And people think it's yeah. luck, but I'm sure it happened to you all the time to your day, right? I have learned from observation that there are certain people who have certain mindset, energy, whatever, but it is probably more of a spiritual, emotional thing or some sort of quantum entanglement if you want to make up something that we haven't proved yet is the cause, but at least it's a conceivable cause. There's something going on there. There's people who can just routinely manifest uh, and they defy the odds. Yes. Right? And they, you could say, well, that's great because for every one person who does that, a hundred million people tried and failed, yeah. so they didn't defy the odds at all. They're just the ones. Maybe that's the case, but it just seems uncanny the number of people who get there um, who are in that abundance, gratitude, giving, not no fear about money mindset. Yeah. But I also know a bunch of wealthy people who are also incredibly afraid mm-hmm. of losing, and it and it actually runs their life. Yeah. And they're miserable people, and you walk in a room and you can feel it. Um, but it may be a selection bias, but I know so many people are like, "Wow, I I have this money. What can I do that's going to help the most people with it? Because it's more than I need." Mm-hmm. And they're not necessarily going to give it away. They might, "Oh, I'm going to start a company that solves a problem," uh, which is a form of risking your money, maybe making more, or maybe not. But they're they're doing something. They're not just sitting there, kind of swimming in piles of of gold coins or something bizarre. Mm-hmm. But in your your work, you teach about how getting rich quickly actually is a bad thing because it doesn't make you happy. <laughs> uh-huh. Why does getting rich quickly not make you happy? Why Why is speed bad from that perspective? You know, uh, fast money is a busy money. So that um, rushes you. So uh, quick money uh, makes you feel like you want to do something more. So usually you invest in something without uh, doing some research. So if you're uh, building wealth slowly, that usually stay in your system. But if the money comes in very fast, you want to do something fast too. So somehow uh, there's a saying in Japanese, uh, uh, fool and money cannot live together. And probably you have a same, similar expression in, in English too. But if you uh, make money fast, uh, you are not used to being wealthy and you're not uh, used to feeling comfortable with the number of uh, money, um, the, dum- the number you have. So you quickly make decisions. And so it, even if you have uh, quick money, you have to let it sit at least for a year or two and then just feel uh, and, and you have to soak yourself into the number. And then if you feel more comfortable, you can start making decisions. But usually fast money makes you c- go crazy. That's how the, the human psyche works. And I don't know why. So you, but... don't, you don't value the money because it came so quickly, so yes. you you don't yeah, you, you don't treat it as an honored guest in, in the way you write about it in your book, right? So you know, it's just like okay. a remote control with, with with a TV. I don't know how it works. Maybe there's there are some people who can explain scientifically, but I don't care because when it wa- watch you know want push one channel one will show up. So like for me, I learned this from my uh, experiences and also from a mentor. When you appreciate money, money comes more. So. I don't know how it wor- why it works, but I, I know how it works, and it works. So as long as uh, it works, I think you don't have to question it so much. And uh, if it's not uh, super hard to do it, um, I recommend people do start doing it today. When you you know receive money, when you give out or spend money, just thank the money. Arigato the money, and and that will shift your life. I promise. And it doesn't cost anything. 
Right. I, I love sharing what we'll call these hacks, but basically techniques that you can do that, uh-huh. that aren't expensive, that yeah. give really high returns, not mm-hmm. dollar returns, but happiness returns. Yeah. yeah. And also a dollar return too. Yeah. A dollar return is nothing wrong with that. Uh-huh. Now, you talk in your book about, and in other interviews, that you can get financial independence in three years by building a system to multiply your gifts. And you have to have at least three gifts yes. to multiply. Uh-huh. What are gifts and how do you multiply them? Because a lot of people listening would love to be financially independent. Three right. Years. Actually, um, I teach uh, a few things. And one of them is uh, creating <clears throat> financial independence in your life. I achieved financial independence when I was 29. And I've been teaching ever since. So uh, the key to financial independence you have to come up with something from you unless you're super rich. You have to start trading what you have. And uh, uh, the, the highest value you have is your gift. And it's usually in, in your system. But you don't know, uh, unless you start using it, you don't know what gift is. For example, I started writing books when I was 33. I never knew I, I had a gift of writing, you know. But uh, since I've written more than uh, 50 some books, published 140 and sold 7 million, I must have a certain gift. But I didn't know until I was 33. If that's one gift, yeah. what do you multiply it by? Yeah, so okay. for example, I multiply writing gift and also speaking gift. And also I'm a healer. I heal people, uh, money wounds and family wounds around money. So with a combination of these writer, speaker, and a healer, I'm the only one in Japan and could be uh, one of the very few in the world that uh, there are so many people teach um, money and there are so many financial advisors, but they are not a healer. And also I'm all, more of an entertainer. That's why I attract 1,500 and 2,100 people at one time for my lecture because they want to laugh and cry about money. So I'm a more comedian and also like a lecturer type too. So if I uh, combine, uh, if you combine your say writer, speaker, healer, entertainer, you become a number one. And then if you want to uh, do it, use your gift, if you're uh, good at uh, sales, and if you're good at connecting people, if you're uh, funny, you know, you can have a, a sales club and you, you, can, you can be very successful. So you have to come up with not only one or like a three or four gifts you have. And then uh, unless you use it, you never know that you even have it, have them. So you have doing something to find your gifts. Is there a certain age or time in people's lives when they they probably figured out their gifts? You go through a period in your early 20s of exploration. Uh-huh. Your prefrontal cortex finishes when you're about 25. Right. And you realize, oh, you know what? I, I actually suck at that, although my parents wanted me to be good at That's it. That's true. And uh, you know, there's something else. This is actually my gift. Uh, when when do most people know their gifts? I think you know I I've, I've been teaching this for over twenty years, and I taught people how to discover their gifts. And from that, I found that people start finding gifts at various uh, different ages. And usually, people find about uh, who they are from twenty five to thirty five to forty five. It it's never too late. Uh, like Connor Sanders, he started his uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken a little later on, right? So some people mm-hmm. find their gifts in their 40s. It's never too late. But preferably, if you are um, kind of like starting uh, uh, exploring gifts from your ter- 20s, 30s, and then discover one by one, you'll be able to combine something, integrate them in your own unique way. And that will usually show after 40. So Napoleon Hill once said, unless you reach 40, you cannot create something. And I agree with him because... Uh, we are so stupid till 40 at least, and maybe nowadays 50, you know, to, <laughs> it takes time uh, for the maturity. There are a few examples. That, the, the two that I, I've mentioned the most probably are Mark Andreessen, mm-hmm. uh, who wrote the first web browser. And I, I know because I wrote a review of the first web browser uh, of his, his first product wow. uh, versus another thing for a magazine. And when he did that, I was already the first person to sell anything over the internet. Wow. Now, Mark Andreessen is a multi-billionaire, uh-huh. and I'm not, just to, to be super clear. The big difference between us, aside from me uh, you know, being better looking, just kidding, Mark, <laughs> if you're listening. Uh, but the real big difference is that Mark, for some reason, though he was nowhere near 40, he was in his 20s just like me, he went out and he found a mentor. 
a guy named Jim Clark from Sun Microsystems, and listened, right? And I'm like, I know everything. Like, I'm this <laughs> arrogant, you know, young, fat computer scientist guy. And, you know, basically, you know, me against the world that I, I didn't see that there were any helpers out there. So he did the, He did this and, and had great success before it was 40 and actually did world-changing things. And so did Mark Zuckerberg, right? Same thing. He went out there and, and said, oh, I'm going to listen to, I'm going to call it an elder, but someone who's got 20 years more runway. What is it about that kind of person who breaks that Napoleon Hill 40 rule that makes them listen to other people yeah. before most people right. are ready to? Do you yeah. know? Uh, you know, I've in interviewed a geniuses is my category. You know, they discover the gifts or somebody discovered their gifts uh, when they're eight or 10 or 12, uh, like uh, uh, Olympic athletes or uh, professional musicians. People, uh, their neighbors, their teachers find their gifts when they were young. So that's one category, genius people. And uh, uh, like uh, um, people who are entrepreneurs who start when they're 16 or 18, they are somewhat genius, not super genius, but they believe they could believe in themselves and never stopped. So those people start early. But for like most of us, regular people, we kind of start just waking up in their late 20s and then, oh my God, you know, there, there must be more to life. And then we start uh, searching and we may, we may get married, we get divorced, and then there are a lot of certain things happening. So probably by the time we reach certain maturity, we are already 40 or 50. And I think it's okay because life is a, a journey. It's not just a destination. So even if you, you make a million dollars in your 20s, that doesn't mean that, as you said, you can keep the money till you die. So I think you, you might as well enjoy the journey you don't have to. You don't need to complain or uh, compare with other people. If you find what you love in your thirties, that's great. And if you find what you love in your fifties, that's also great too. All right. You talked about you know, doing something uh, until you die, uh -huh. and that's my my final question in uh, Bulletproof Radio these days. My next book, uh, Superhuman, is about what I'm doing to live to at least 180. Wow. And I think it's. I think it's actually doable. Uh -huh. uh, and there's a, a bunch of science and actions and actually one Japanese herb that probably no one's ever heard of. Wow. It comes from a Japanese island that I use and a probiotic from Japan, believe it or uh -huh. not, because there are some very talented Japanese anti-aging researchers. Yes. By the way, I'm not mentioning what those uh -huh. are in this episode. Wow, I can't wait. In fact, it's, <laughs> it's available. I just, uh, it just hit Amazon for pre-order mm -hmm. uh, right now. Wow. Um, but uh, same day, actually. In fact, all right, let's let's do this. It's super pre-order days for me, but it's the same. Uh, it's out there, and uh, your book just became truly orderable, not pre-ordered, uh -huh. the same day. So if people order your book called Happy Money, uh -huh. and they do Superhuman at the same time, they'll get paired up. Wow, which will be, uh, good for everybody. <laughs> Great. Good. Um, I just thought of this, but thank you. Um, those two those two pieces of research uh, from Japan really stood out. In fact, I cite a lot of Japanese research in the book. But the, the reason I'm bringing all this up is how long do you think you're going to live? You know, realistically, my uh, father died in his 60s and my grandfather died younger. So I'm not expecting to live too long. But because of the technology and the Japanese uh, food and, uh, you know, um, uh, environment, I'm aiming around 80. But after reading your book, maybe I'll expect <laughs> extend a little longer. Can I, I think you can do at least a hundred, man. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. And there's, you, you do have to do some things early on to prevent damage. Yeah. Um, but it, it seems like with what's coming uh, down the pipes, another friend of mine, uh, the day we're recording the show, just uh, announced 2.3 million in funding for his new anti-aging company. And uh, this guy named Reason. And it's just, it, it goes on and on. And, and I, I just feel like this is going to happen. But the real reason I'm asking the question is to understand uh, people's attitudes about death and about old age mm -hmm. and what they think of it. Coming from the Japanese culture, uh, I'm wondering, it, it, and, and I'm, I'm asking you to speak on behalf of a typical Japanese, but there are cultural norms mm -hmm. that are you know, average. Uh, what's the perspective on, on old age? I mean, here it's tubes and wheelchairs and you know being alone in a retirement mm -hmm. home, and people are terrified of that mm -hmm. and forgetting their own name. I see. It, Japan is aging more than the U.S. right yes. now. What's 
what's changed? What is the sense of, of being old in Japan right now? You know, one, one thing good about being Japanese old people is that they get instant respect. Uh -huh. So they get respected no matter who you are. If you're old, you get a special seat in a, a bus uh, or anywhere you go. So people uh, pay uh, a bigger respect for uh, pregnant women and also old, older people. So uh, I think being old in Japan is not a good, you know, bad deal because you get uh, cared by a lot of people. But still, a lot of people are afraid of um, uh, being tubed up in a hospital. So there's a, even a temple. When you go uh, to a temple and pray, you you just die in just uh, a few minutes instead of just getting getting into bed for like three years. A quick death versus yeah. an American death. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, uh, but I think uh, because of a med medical situation, we uh, like I I read somewhere like eighty some percent of the old medical care is spent on the last two years of your life or something, you know. So, yeah, and I think it's probably true anywhere. But our medical system, and I think probably U.S. and other countries are so uh, overwhelmed by the cost. So we'll see how it goes too. If your books uh, are more popular in, uh, internationally, we'll probably have less medical bills in the world. That's one of my goals, even for for Bulletproof. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, you do a few things now. The return over time is very, very high, right. especially if they taste good. Yeah, it, it's really beautiful the way you describe uh, having you know, respect for your elders in the U.S. I have. I go out of my way. I have a lot of friends who are, uh, they have more mileage than I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> People in their 70s and 80s. Uh, and I get a lot of, uh, just a lot of learning uh, from them. And you realize, wow, like there, there's so, so much going on. But most of them have described, uh, when we talk about this kind of stuff, uh, arriving sometime in their mid 50s, usually 60s, where they feel like they become invisible mm -hmm. in, in the US. Mm -hmm. Where in, instead of being respected and saying, well, you've, you know, you've done all these things and you have all this knowledge and they're actually ready to give back, but they just like people don't see me anymore and they, and they don't know why. Mm. But it sounds like in Japan, at least the respect is is there. And I'm I'm really hoping that by having this conversation about what does being old actually look like, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like people think it does in the U.S. where you don't know your own name and you know you die painfully and slowly. Um, that's not the future that we're facing. Yeah. Yeah, um, but part of it means that we're going to have a lot of healthy people who have a lot more knowledge and wisdom, and frankly, a lot more money than young people if they manage their investments. That's right. Because well, yeah. we have a hundred years of interest on that twenty dollars <laughs> you put away when you were seven. It's probably going to be worth something, right? right? So I, I feel like the world's going to change, but we haven't thought about it yet. So I'm really, I was asking you that question, but I, I love being able to compare the the respect shown for an older person in Japan versus uh, what quite often, but not always happens in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there are videos of you know, people getting out of their bus seat or a subway seat you know, for someone older, and I, I, would, I, I go out of my way to do that. Mm -hmm. And I would encourage anyone listening to do that. You know, pay attention. There's, I guarantee you that someone twice your age has something to teach you. Yes, definitely. So uh, my mentor, Wahei Takeda, was uh, always surrounded by young people uh, in his um, 80s. So he was happy and smiling all the time, and um, he shared his wisdom uh, so graciously, graciously, so uh, young people listen so intensively. And that was so beautiful wa to watch. Yeah, I, I think we're gonna see a world with more of that. Uh, Ken Honda, uh, thanks for writing your book, Happy Money. You're talking about some really hard to write about things in a very elegant and eloquent way. Uh, to let us think more about wh what do we feel towards our money as it comes in and as it goes out. And I highly recommend uh, Happy Money. And uh, you're listening to the show today, uh, you can certainly go to kenhonda.com and learn more about all of Ken's work. But if you were to take one thing away from this, next time you're going to spend a buck, uh, just be grateful that you're spending the dollar instead of sad that you're, quote, losing the dollar and see what that does I would, for me at least, I would look like like right in the middle of your chest. Like, what's the physical sensation of feeling different about your money, and see what happens. I I think you'll find Ken's work has merit. I certainly do. Thank you so much. All right, if you loved today's episode, I'd love it if you did me a favor. This is more than episode number six hundred, so that's it's a lot of time putting into the radio show and just sharing cool stuff. 
I would love it if you went out there and picked up a copy of Happy Money because it will return its value to you many times over. And if at the same time you pick up a copy of Superhuman, my new book about anti-aging, it'll help everyone who wants to live a long time also have more gratitude and wealth in their life because when you buy the two together, everybody wins. Superhuman plus Happy Money equals good times. (laughs) 